level is level one. Level one is very free right now as of the And again, level four from the level. Dr. Moni Abraham Kuriakos is leading various position in head and neck cancer and of course he started head and neck cancer super specialty program in India. Now he is leading Narayana Vidyalaya Masundarsha Cancer Center and he is of course he is going to take a new position in Toronto Government Cancer Center. Sir, we welcome you to this program sir. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, you have a great position in the holding in, uh, internationally, nationally and even uh, advisory committee for uh, state also, sir, in our state also. How do you feel, sir, for past uh, 20 years you are there, you are conducting the, so many programs in cancer. Uh, what about our Chinese, whether they are taking up really the cancer is necessary for, I mean, cancer treatment is necessary. What's your uh, perception? Yeah, I'm delighted that I have an opportunity, an opportunity to get involved in the cancer management, particularly all cancer management, because I got involved in the oral cancer or head and neck cancer management because uh, I start as a dentist and uh, I see a lot of uh, cancer patients uh, during my dental student days and uh, I strongly felt that uh, we as a gatekeeper of uh, oral cancer should take responsibility. And for me, that took a very, very long route. I started dentistry in medicine and all that thing. And then uh, I was working as a professor in New York University. Then uh, I thought uh, my calling is in India, so I decided to come back to India. Not very much a personal uh, reason. I want to do what is uh, possible uh, and what is best uh, India can offer. So at least I come back and join Amrita. Then um, over there, as you said, I we started the uh, first uh, uh, training program. Training is extremely important. One of the problem we have is that we have a lot of uh, patients, a lot of very good surgeons. Unfortunately, the training is not structured. So it's not the, the younger generation doesn't get their structured training. So they go around to get training. That to me, it's not, uh, not necessary. See, my time, I have to go to about two different countries, two continents to get training. But in 21st century, India has a patient, he has the human process to take a train next generation. It's our responsibility. And the training, one of the problems we have is that if we, surgical training is a, it's a, it's a hands-on training. So unless uh, the other, the trainee learn to, to operate, uh, he or she will not be able to deliver, like any sculpture or music playing, you cannot know, watch and play a music instrument. So we have to train. That is as a guru type of person, you and me, our responsibility to train because we learn. And we learn the hard way, but our next step should be learning the shorter time. Because all of us have the extra number of years to work. During that time, we have to be professional, and we should be able to, to deliver. Coming back to to uh, what I what, what the way I look at things is that it's a as I said, it's a great blessing. And then um, uh, from a maxillofacial point of view, I could work in the the maxillofacial community, and as a head and neck group, I could uh, serve in the, the broader head and neck uh, fraternity too. That is a Now I am going to join, uh, not in Trivandrum, in Cochin. I worked in, never worked in government sector before. And I have been working in the private sector. And I noticed that there is a limitation what we can do in the private sector. It's only what I can deliver in that uh, particular hospital. But if I work in the government sector, the impact I can have, the, the group can have, is uh, society-wide. And like our here, must say that there's a society-wide impact. Similarly, if I stick around in a, a small uh, department, what I can do, I can <coughs> have a handful of people. I cannot make an impact to society. That's why I decided to join the uh, government hospital in Kochi. What uh, you as a very eminent clinical professor and clinical surgeon, you are doing a kind of research, whatever you are doing in cancer is enormous. Eh? Whether you are going to continue your research work into the government setup or you are going to go away from the uh, See, research? 
you know, good that you asked me. Research to me is not a job, <coughs> like a passion. Say, for example, I was talking to somebody earlier, I was mentioning about a, one of your colleagues who is interested in, in photography. Similarly, for me, research is a passion. I do it because I enjoy doing it. And to me, it's an opportunity to, to discover new things. And there is no better person than a clinician doing research because I know exactly what is not on my problems. So the, the, the person who can guide in research and give direction has to be a clinician. So to me, there is no question I'm going to continue because it's my passion, like painting or uh, I do running and painting. Similarly, this is uh, my passion and continue. And uh, it's not because the institution asks for it, because I want to do it. So for these young surgeons, uh, do you really need both the degrees, kind of MBBS and BDS necessary for the maxillofacial or head and neck training people, sir? Because you lived so many countries, you worked in so many hospitals in different countries. Right, right. I don't, see, I don't think it is a medical degree is totally mandated because we need a large number of uh, uh, well-trained doctors in the country. But the problem is that we cannot deliver comprehensive care without medical support. Okay. So if you are working in a comprehensive cancer center, comprehensive cancer center with all the facilities we have, then a single qualified person can deliver, we can do a beautiful operation. But if you are practicing in surgery in oncology in a community without medical practice almost impossible, we will miss a lot of things. So that if you are working in a, in a, in a, in a private uh, practice kind of setting, I think medical training is important. But in a government, uh, no, sorry, the comprehensive cancer center, we have a lot of other people to help you out. So there is no need for that. Uh, having said that, we have to, as I said, we have to, India has to be the leaders give direction to, to academic and maximum social cancer care. So there should be a group of uh, our fraternity should do medicine. Okay. And they, we cannot, we can encourage some people to do it. Some people can work in a multidisciplinary team that can be a good technician, a good surgeon, they do a beautiful operation. That can, but it should be some, he or she should be supported by appropriate medical uh, Coming to the public sector, so Coming to the public sector, some 20 years before, the cancer is just above 60, 65 years of age or above 60 years of age. Now we can see a lot of young people having cancer without uh, any kind of habits, uh, whether genetically modified or uh, the environment which is causing cancer. Is there anything that we can prevent from not only getting a cancer, kind of cancer? Yeah, absolutely. See, I think that is where we need more research. See, if you look at uh, the head and neck cancer or the cavity cancer, 60 to 70 percent is caused by tobacco and uh, good karma, no question about that. But 30 percent of the patients do develop cancer, which we do not know the reason. Now, one head and neck, the our field itself, the head and neck area, or of pharynx cancer, people found that it's caused by HPV. But previously, a lot of oral pharynx cancer patients used to come with no risk habits, they did not know the amplified HPV. Similarly, about 30 percent of the oral cavity cancer is caused by something. Cancer does not uh, develop without a reason, and uh, it's our responsibility to find out what could be the reason. And uh, HPV type of uh, organism needs to be identified. Or oral microbiota is one area we need to explore. So definitely, uh, uh, this is called for research in that front. So you, as my teacher, as well as my mentor, you taught so many things in my life as well as in the surgery. Uh, for example, for which neck dissection for any kind of oral cancer, we can accept tongue cancer, we can limit within the supraphomyoid level. This is the uh, research or evidence-based formula that we give. Is that any kind of message that you can give it to public sector, whether this oral cancer or the maxillofacial cancer, whether it's curable or not? See, if you look at all the cancers the human body has, and oral cavity cancer is one of the most curable cancers most curable cancer. Now, provided it is diagnosed at the early stage. Today, we had two patients. One was a T1 tumor cancer, T1 MCR cancer. Cure rate is already 80, 85 percent. Not many cancer, human cancers got that cure rate. But the second patient we had was cancer went into the mastocardial space. It's T4B cancer. Still curable, almost 60 percent of the more curable, but still uh, we, the number could have been uh, increased significantly. 
not only the cure, look at the morbidity that patient, two of the patients uh, will have. The first patient will be almost function like a normal person. Second patient will spend uh, how many hours to do the operation. The function result will be bad. Even though we can cure, the quality of life is poor. So my message to the menstrual patient community and the general uh, society is that oral cancer is curable, but we need to identify the cancer at the early stage. That is our responsibility, all of our responsibility. That message we have to widely spread, particularly among dentists and menstrual patients. And uh, even for dentists or uh, general practitioners, uh, once they diagnose that they are having oral cancer, they don't know where to send to surgery, to radiotherapy or to chemotherapy because most of the doctors, if he is a radiologist, he started treating him radiation. He is a medical oncologist or his friends are calling this medical oncologist, he will be starting chemotherapy. Of course, he is a surgeon, then they will be sending to surgery. How you are directing this dentist or this young practitioners uh, to treat the I think you hit the you hit the nail in the right spot. See the uh, the, the problem we have we do not have a referral pathway. Yes, sir. absolutely no referral pathway, right. and we blame a lot of uh, things. You uh, the moment uh, patient cancer is diagnosed, uh, uh, first of all almost three months delay in diagnosis by uh, the primary care yes. settings, and then the, when the patient is goes to a cancer center another three months delay. So altogether almost six months is gone okay. because he or she, the primary care, do not first of all recognize what is the health cancer and whom to refer to. So uh, currently we do not have a system. Okay. Now how to develop the system? Okay. So that is our responsibility. So all of us oncology practitioners uh, have the responsibility to develop a network. So there is no point in operating on, a, if you sit in a cancer center, operate, you get advanced case cancer. That's what we do in guys. A hospital, almost 80 percent of cancer coming to us on stage four, stage, uh, stage three, stage four. Uh, the cure rate is poor. So we have to work to develop a network, uh, particularly with the primary care doctor as well as the dentist, and then ask them to refer the patients to you, and then you should be able to uh, refer the patient for appropriate treatment. To all the cavity cancer, the surgeon should be the gatekeeper. So refer, and then uh, refer to the appropriate place. Now, one of the problem we have is that uh, we should nobody should do a cancer care without the backup of a multidisciplinary team. Doing an operation without actual treatment is nothing more than a biopsy. I'll give an example. We did the, this uh, uh, advanced cancer study uh, done in our, our center, uh, like a T4B case we did uh, in a patient who did surgery with actual radiotherapy with cure rate of 62 percent. When they did not have <coughs> it came down to 16 percent, 16 percent. That just huge shows difference. a huge difference. That shows that if you do just a plastic surgeon, you just operate and send the patient, you get uh, radiation at uh, some place, then you don't get uh, the cure. And if you don't cure, the, the message will go around that this is not a cure for cancer. So you put the same cost the service only to that particular patient, but to the entire oral cancer community. So it's very important that the whole tree the cancer should have a multidisciplinary team to support. But the referral should be a primary care to a specialist, a maxillary specialist of oncologist, and from that person should be working in a multidisciplinary team. Whether work in a cancer center or a virtual cancer center doesn't matter. But patient should be should receive uh, treatment at the right time. Thank you, sir. Thanks for your valuable time, sir. Because. Thank <laughs> you.